How big is reality? Of all human knowledge, the most stunning may be multiple universes. Multiple universes. Start with our one universe. Our universe is immense, an observable diameter of almost 100 billion light years and perhaps infinite in size. So more than one universe may seem like confusion, but many universes, very many universes, perhaps an infinite number of universes may be reality. Several decades ago, when I first heard about multiple universes, or the multiverse as it's called, it was like science fiction. More recently, with spectacular advances in cosmic measurements, most cosmologists now believe that multiple universes truly exist. But must multiple universes exist? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. Why have multiple universes gone from fanciful speculation to conventional wisdom? Why the leap in scientific confidence that multiple universes are actually out there? To get the latest on the multiverse, I go to Vieques Island, Puerto Rico, to attend the biennial gathering of the Foundational Questions Institute, FQXI, cosmologists and physicists who grapple with frontier theories. Some are old friends whom I haven't seen in years. Why are they now more confident in multiple universes? Vieques' rugged jungles set against the vast surrounding sea seem to resonate with radical ideas and infinite spaces. I see Alex Valenkin, director of the Institute of Cosmology at Tufts University. Alex is known for the quantum creation of the universe and eternal inflation. We last talked in 2007. What does he now think in 2014? Alex, when I first heard about multiple universes several decades ago, it was wild speculation, but just electrifying. Today, multiple universes are the standard model. Uh, you've been a key player in making this happen. Walk me through this history and, and where we are today. By multiple universes, uh, you could possibly mean different things. One way of thinking about what the universe is is all we can observe, and that's rather limited, because light had time to get us from the Big Bang, only from a limited region of space. And of course, if you call that universe, then we are pretty sure that beyond that, other regions similar to that exist. So in this sense, it is pretty uncontroversial to say that there are multiple universes. However, uh, the theory of inflation uh, brought with it a new concept of um, multiple universes. The idea of inflation is that there is this period of extremely rapid expansion in the early history of the universe. And when you work out this theory, you find that inflation, which ended in our region of space, creating this uh, stuff that we see with galaxies, stars, and so forth, did not end everywhere at once. There are other outside kind of big bubble that we inhabit. There is still inflation continuing and forming new and new bubbles all the time. And the space between these bubbles is expanding very fast, uh, making room for new bubbles to form. And these bubbles expand at speed approaching the speed of light, so we cannot possibly travel to other bubbles. For all practical purposes, each of these uh, inflationary bubbles is a separate self-contained universe. And they can, in principle, have different physical properties. So what you're saying is that with the inflation that you believe is necessary in this universe, by virtue of, of, of its characteristics, must be happening again and again. Must may be a little <laughs> stronger word that I would use, but if you try to avoid this, yeah. you kind of mutilate the theory. So it's uh, the natural consequence of inflation is the existence of this multiverse mm -hmm. in this sense. And so as you look uh, 
at this vast ensemble of universes, can you begin to characterize them? Obviously, one is like ours. <laughs> so, in principle, it is conceivable that all bubbles have similar physical properties to ours. This would not contradict anything that we know. But a wide variety of particle physics models that have been proposed, like supergravity theories, grand unified theories, string theory, they generally predict a part in addition to our low energy physics. By low energy, I mean the energies that are accessible to us here. Apart from our kind of environment, there can exist a number, and sometimes an astonishingly large number, for some of the theories, of different, what physicists call vacua. Mm -hmm. The property of inflation is that it will explore the whole landscape of these vacua. So whatever particle physics provides, in the course of inflation, regions with all these properties that are allowed by particle physics are going to be formed. So it will explore the entire landscape of the fundamental theory. Why is that? Why, why can you say that inflation explores the landscape? Why not just explore the particular one that we have now? Because that's the data point that we know. Well, it is because the transitions between these different vacua occur through quantum tunneling. Mm -hmm. So we are located in some minimum of the energy. Uh, of this landscape, and uh, there are other minima, and uh, quantum mechanics allows you to tunnel through energy barriers to other minima. Moreover, quantum mechanics tells us uh, that if uh, the transition between these two minima is not absolutely forbidden by some conservation law, then it is inevitably happening. So basically the answer is that quantum mechanics tells us that all possible transitions will happen between all the possible states. Alex contends that because the same process that best explains the Big Bang origin of our universe, cosmic inflation, does not end everywhere at once, inflation continues to generate other Big Bang universes. Well, I, I just Alex won't quite say inflation uh, must generate other sure. universes. Rather, a multiverse is the natural consequence of inflation. The originator of the theory of cosmic inflation, MIT's Alan Guth, is here, and I find him. How does Alan assess increasing acceptance of his astonishing theory? Alan, it's great to get together again. Uh, the last time we talked, maybe six years ago. And what I've noticed is among cosmologists, there seems to be now almost an assumption that multiple universes do exist and talking about the details of it, et cetera, as opposed to asking the question, is this a danger? Well, it's hard to know. Uh, I, I think it's, it's unfair to say that everybody who works in cosmology <laughs> believes in the multiverse. It's still uh, treated as a, a hypothesis, uh, but it is certainly a hypothesis that more and more people are talking about. To what do you attribute that to? What I think I attribute it to is the mystery of the cosmological constant, oh. uh, which we interpret as a indication of energy density of the vacuum, non-zero energy density of just empty space. Now, from the point of view of particle physics, that's not exactly a surprise that it exists, because the vacuum it really is a very complicated state. It's, there are quantum fluctuations all the time, uh, particles that appear and disappear in, back into the vacuum. Uh, and now with the discovery of the Higgs particle, we even have very firm evidence uh, that there's a field in nature which has a non-zero value in the vacuum on average. The problem though is that when we try to estimate what that energy density might be, we miss by okay. a fantastic factor a factor of like 10 to the 120, uh, one with 120 decimal zeros after it. So it's a big mystery why the energy density of the vacuum is so incredibly low compared to what we might expect. And theoretically, it has to be somewhere in that range in order to allow what we see to occur with the formation of galaxies and stars and planets and, and life as we know it. That's right. For life to evolve, uh, there's at least a good argument uh, that one needs to have an incredibly narrow uh, incredibly small value for this vacuum energy. But the best mechanism we know for sort of producing that is the multiverse. Mm -hmm. And most of the people here accept more or less the ideas coming out of string theory that there's a colossal number of possible vacua that are allowed by the ultimate laws of physics. Mm -hmm. And that they would have a spread of energy densities. And because there's so many of them, like 10 to the 500, even though the number that we see is incredibly small compared to the spread, 
uh, there still will be many different vacua in that interval. What are some uh, other pieces of evidence? Uh, because there are multiple ways that, uh, that seem to confirm the existence of it. Well, the other argument uh, that I rely on uh, is the simple fact that there's a lot of evidence for inflation, and almost all versions of inflation lead automatically to eternal inflation, inflation that once it starts never ends, and this eternal inflation goes on producing what in this context we usually call pocket universes, uh, but we would be living in one of these pocket universes. So that's in a sense uh, a two-step process to the multiverse. One is that you need inflation in this universe to explain how this universe works, and then when you have inflation, when you look at inflation, you say, whoops, you know, once, right. once I get this thing once started. Once you get it, it's hard to stop. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Right. So even though we can't see these other universes, we can say that the same theory is that give us the best explanation we have of the properties of our visible universe predicts that it's going to go on forever, producing an infinite number mm -hmm. of pocket universes. The overall, if took a survey of cosmology... Alan is both confident and cautious. Confident that more cosmologists are taking inflation seriously. Cautious that inflation is still a hypothesis. To Alan, two lines of thinking lead to the multiverse. First, as a consequence of cosmic inflation, which enjoys increasing scientific support. Second, as a way of explaining the incredibly small and fine-tuned cosmological constant, the dark energy of empty space, which is required for our universe to have structure. Because over the years, no other explanation other than the multiverse seems to work. Why does the fine-tuning of our universe motivate the multiverse? I ask one of the pioneers of the so-called string theory landscape, where different laws of physics can emerge in different universes. Physicist Raphael Busso. Raphael, multiple universes are no longer some wild speculation. It's the conventional wisdom. Do you surely believe that there are multiple universes? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> As a physicist, I consider it to be my mission not to surely believe anything uh, okay. until uh, we have uh, overwhelming evidence for it. Uh, and it would be crazy for me to say that there surely are multiple universes. What's not crazy to say is that it's very difficult to understand many of the properties of our universe if we assume that there is only one way to make the effective laws of physics that we see. Uh, it's very difficult to understand why empty space has so little energy in it. Uh, our laws generically predicted should have a lot. It's very difficult to understand why the laws of particle physics, the forces between particles, their masses and so on, appear to be uh, tuned in such a way as to allow for very complex phenomena to exist in our universe. Gener generic thing would be that there's either no energy at all to burn up or that it all burns up very quickly and nothing interesting ever happens. So you have to understand where these properties of the universe that we do see come from. The explanations that we do have involve the possibility that the laws of physics can be effectively different in different parts of the universe. And I really want to uh, de-dramatize this idea of the multiverse. It's not so different from having a tank of water separated by a wall of glass from some area that's filled by air. We wouldn't say those are multiple universes. They're just places where the speed of sound is different, the speed of light is effectively different, but the same fundamental laws operate on both sides of that wall. The thing that we've discovered in cosmology is, is that it's very easy to get huge tanks of water. They're so huge that you can't see the other side that has air or some other effective laws of physics operating in it. It's very natural to get that kind of behavior. It's just the old story that what we think the universe is, is usually a, a very small part of what the universe actually is. The universe is much bigger than you thought. There's many other ways you can put together the laws of physics. And we, of course, happen to find ourselves in a place where complex stuff does emerge. In fact, I like to think of it still differently. Uh, Raphael recognizes that for our universe to enable complex phenomena, such as life, many physical properties or laws must be fine-tuned. And the only natural explanation for such fine-tuning would be if different physical properties or laws exist in different parts of the cosmos. Because given vast numbers of universes, then just at random, some universes will be congenial to life. 
This reasoning provides independent support for multiple universes, or independent regions of the same universe, as Raphael prefers, which are predicted by theoretical physics. Another reason why multiple universes existing in parallel have become more mainstream is that there seem to be more mechanisms for generating them. I asked cosmologist Max Tegmar, the scientific director of FQXI and the organizer of the Vieques Conference, to guide me through the thicket of theories for generating multiple universes. Max famously proposes four levels of multiple universes. To me, the most exciting question actually isn't whether there are parallel universes, but how many different levels of parallel universes there are. Our universe, by that we simply mean not all of space, but the three-dimensional part of space that light has had time to reach us from so far during the 13.8 billion years. This, which we've photographed the edges of with our best telescopes. And I don't have a single colleague in astrophysics who thinks that space actually ends here at the edge. They all think that if you waited another billion years, you would see some more galaxies that light ride from us. The question is, how far does it go on? If it goes on forever, we have a vast level one multiverse, which is so huge that there probably are even other copies of us and all sorts of other wild and crazy things. And as if that wasn't big enough, there can also be a, a level two multiverse. You know, this whole infinite space then would have come from one single big bang. And uh, there could be other big bangs that made other ones which are in practice impossible to travel to, where there's more diversity, where even uh, some of the apparent laws of physics we learn in school are different. This could help solve a lot of uh, outstanding puzzles we encounter, like dark energy and so on. It would explain why we have just exactly the right value needed for life, because in this whole multiverse, it's only in places like that where the cosmological constants gets measured and people ask. And then it's just turned out to be so hard to come up with any fundamental physics theory that predicts the existence of only what we see in here and nothing else, that also when we've studied the micro world, quantum mechanics, we found that it gives us a third level of parallel universes where we can effectively be in several places at once, except there is a sort of censorship mechanism preventing us from realizing these things. So those are the three kinds of parallel universes which are taken somewhat or very seriously now. And the main critique against them has actually shifted from being, oh, this makes no sense and I hate it, <laughs> now, to being, I hate it. <laughs> so now we can actually talk about this seriously at science conferences. Yeah. All right, level four. This is where you put your stake in the ground. So this is the most controversial kind, where I am one of the very few proponents of it. And uh, if indeed our universe is completely mathematical, what you can do is you can, in principle, write a computer program which just churns out the list of all mathematical structures. And uh, you will find there the simple ones that we know and love, like the cube and the dodecahedron and various Calabi Yao manifolds and Hilbert spaces and all sorts of stuff. And somewhere on that list should be the mathematical structure that we are in now. And uh, what we have to remember about mathematical structures is that they cannot be created because they don't exist in some kind of space and time. Rather, space and time exists within some of them. So they all just exist. And if there are other ones that can also support life and intelligent, self-aware observers who talk about things and think, they're going to feel just as real in theirs as we feel in ours. And this ultimately means then that our reality isn't just purely mathematical, but also just vastly grander than we thought. Here are Max's four levels of multiple or parallel universes. Level one, our own universe far larger than we can see, perhaps infinitely larger. This is conventional cosmology. Level two, multiple big bangs, each generating its own universe independent of all others. Multiple big bangs are generally accepted. Level three, quantum branching, uncountable parallel worlds splitting off continuously. Quantum branching is controversial. Level four, consistent mathematical systems, each able to generate entire worlds. This would mean that reality is mathematics, a far out idea with few supporters.
however generated, multiple universes makes reality unimaginably and ineffably immense. Can I get some closure on multiple universes? At least for my visit to the Ekes, at least for now? I turn to a physicist who challenges conventional wisdom, Paul Davies. Paul, I remember a conversation we had uh, years ago that uh, uh, you uh, were expressing some doubts about multiple universes. Uh, today, multiple universes is like conventional wisdom. You're absolutely right that it is now uh, fashionable, at least in the circles I move in, to assume that there must be multiple universes and you can get at them in a variety of different ways. And one or two arguments I think are really quite compelling. The one that I give is that you have to take a position about our universe, this one, how did it begin? And we all agree it was a big bang and if that was uh, the ultimate origin of the universe, it didn't just join on to something else, then we can say, well, was that a natural process or a supernatural process? Well, as a scientist, I'd like to believe there's a natural process underpinning it. Well, any natural process that can happen can happen again. And so you're led on this very general ground to suppose that there must be other Big Bangs scattered throughout space and time and other universes that follow from it. So that's a, a very general argument. Of course, you run into the problem, is this science? If this is just an armchair prediction, is it of any value? And I think that is a valid argument because uh, you can play around with mathematical games, but unless there are observable consequences for us here in this universe, uh, probably that's a bit of a pointless exercise. So there is a sort of mad scramble uh, to try to find how the presence of other universes might leave an imprint in the cosmic background radiation or something of that sort. Some of this stuff has an air of desperation about it, I must admit, <laughs> but it's true that the pendulum has swung. And when I was a student, uh, people were baffled enough about this one universe without having to invoke a multiplicity of them. What fascinates or disturbs me, I'm not sure, is you have this nesting of a very large number, maybe an infinite number of ways that multiple universes are generated and then mul in infinities within those infinities. I, I mean, mm -hmm. th this either begins to uh, make you crazy or to say something's wrong with this whole picture. Right, it's very easy to think up ways of getting other universes. And in fact, you are assured that in a spatially infinite universe, there will be regions which will be like clones of each other, an infinite number of them. So once you're into the game of infinity, of course, you get all sorts of weird consequences. And th the question is, how do we wrap our heads around that? Do we say, well, this is a sort of reductio ad absurdum of the application of mathematics to the world? Mm -hmm. Is it legitimate? We just have to live with it. Uh, the universe is weirder than we thought. <laughs> but at the end of the day, there is an answer that is the right answer. Right, so it could be that there are an infinite number of other universes or there are not. And then the next question is, will we ever know? And could we ever know? Even in principle, could we ever know? Yeah. And in some of these models, even in principle, we could never know. Of course, that's the most logical thing. Yeah. In one sense of thinking, if I put myself in a dark room, I'd see the only logical things are nothing at all, I mean really nothing at all, or an infinite number of everything. Right, so there are only two natural states of affairs. Nothing exists or everything exists. And if, like most people, you believe that less than everything that could exist really does exist, then who got to decide what separated the realm of things which actually exist from the realm of those things which could have existed but don't? Right. Um, supposing you drew that boundary differently. And so that seems very strange because it looks like a selection has been made. Yeah. You can imagine an urn full of all possibilities, all possible existing things, and that some <laughs> magic hand has pulled out a privileged subset. And yeah. okay, existence is bestowed upon you, tough for the rest. Yeah. That seems very strange. Yeah. And yet, is it any stranger than nothing exists, everything exists? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I love multiple universes. They force me to face the first question of reality. How big is it? At first, I didn't get it. I was trying to understand the potential size of an inflating universe, and I was staring at some huge exponential numbers. But I couldn't find the measurement units. Was the size of the inflating universe measured in meters or light years, I wondered? An enormous difference. Then it hit me. It doesn't matter. 
The exponential numbers are so colossal that it doesn't matter whether the measurement units are the diameter of a proton or of the entire visible universe. The smallest scale, the Planck length, differs from the largest scale, the visible universe, by about 60 orders of magnitude, which is vanishingly small compared with the immense size of an inflating universe. And an inflating universe is only one kind of multiple universe. One lesson we humans should have learned is that however large we've imagined reality to be, our imaginations were always too small. Perhaps they still are. Multiple universes have become generally accepted. That's astonishing. But must they exist? That's not quite yet closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com. <laughs>